Karamoja region in northeast Uganda is a mystery even to those Ugandans who live in the south. Dry and desolate, the region is home to more than a million people. Most are barely getting by, surviving on only one meal a day if they are lucky. Their nomadic lifestyle has kept them on the move for thousands of years. Trying to find grass for their cattle is becoming more difficult every year. This lifestyle forces them to move their villages periodically, building new huts several times during the year, constantly on the move in search of grass and water. Water is life here. In an area that only gets about 12 inches of rain a year, living without enough water is normal. Deep water wells and irrigation systems are needed but they are scarce and hard to find. Cattle wranglers and shepherds have to move their herds many miles between wells and grass. Many NGOs have come here to help, but few remain, leaving without making any significant impact. If you drive 20 miles off this main highway in any direction, you'll find villages that have never been helped by any aid organization. In 1980, a famine killed 21% of the population, including 60% of the infants. In 2015, droughts wiped out 60 to 100% of their crops. The young men in cities and villages are addicted to a homemade alcohol called Waraji. For 2,000 Ugandan shillings, that's about 52 cents, they can buy a pitcher and stay drunk for most of the day. Among the young men, it is a challenge to see how much they can drink until they pass out, forgetting about the troubles of life and their families. Drinks out of a pitcher. <laughs> How much does that picture cost? How much does it cost for that picture? And how much do they drink of that a day? How many? Twenty. Twenty or more than twenty. They want to socialize. They like to socialize to share. Most would rather drink than eat. Mothers make porridge out of their raji and feed it to their children. Many mothers supplement breast milk with the brew. They also give the beer to their older children as well. Alcoholism has destroyed the family unit.
There are very few men who actually support their families. It is mostly left up to the women to provide for their children. Oddly enough, it is the women who make money off this brew, made from sorghum, which is a versatile grain. It is also used to make bread and porridge. In developed countries, it is used to feed cows and to make ethanol. The sorghum you see here is fermented for three days. They grind that one, then they mix with this one, they put the water, and then it is fermented for three days, and then they start now squeezing, squeezing to make it what it is, or they just use it and they pour that water, water they take it. Uh, they can either make it squeeze, and then they take as if it is already uh, uh, filtered, or they can just use it the very way it is. They just pour some water as they keep on drinking, drinking until the local residue remains. That's when they will now give that one to these other children to eat. The women use the money to buy food for their children and to pay for school fees. Once a week, thousands of people come to this market to sell a wide variety of goods. Chickens are always needed, potatoes that rival Idaho's best, cooking supplies, fresh vegetables, and even sickles. It is a gathering place where all of the clans can come and see their friends and family and to catch up on the news. There's a lot of wheeling and dealing going on here trying to get the best price for their prize cattle. So these are the oxen. When you, uh, when you take to the garden, then you put a yoke. Mm -hmm. so you talk of that. As you see, he was demonstrating. He was demonstrating that, that that's how they put a yoke. Then they, they plow. And they're, they're much stronger than normal cows. Rocks are stronger than more than cows. White, 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 Cattle have long been a major source of income for the Kermajong people. They used to be cattle rustlers, stealing cattle from other tribes across the border in Kenya. But these days, after the Ugandan government took away their guns, they are forced to become farmers. Some are learning how to farm reluctantly. It is estimated that close to 150,000 people in the region are still receiving food aid from the World Food Program. Karamojans need a sustainable source of income apart from government handouts if they are to survive. Farming can help, but their hearts aren't in it, and they need irrigation to water the crops. Like in many areas of the world, only the older people are interested in farming. Young people do not like to dig, they want to go to Kampala and seek a more comfortable life. But unfortunately, there are very few jobs to be found, and many end up on the streets. Families are close in Karamoja. They live in these small compounds called manyatas. Built for protection, the walls of this village are built with sticks and briars woven together to form a barrier. This very narrow gate is the entranceway to the village. It is difficult to enter if you are in need of a diet. But as you can see, the Karamojans fit easily through the gate. There are also interior fences meant to protect their cattle. The huts themselves are made of mud, sticks, grass, cow dung, and cow's urine. Women are responsible for making the houses as well as collecting water, firewood, milking cattle, and cooking for the family. The average age in Karamoja is 15 and women typically have eight children. This woman you see here at one time had 10 children. 
but tragically nine have died. Her lone surviving daughter takes care of her. Her story is not uncommon in Uganda. Tragedy is a way of life. Most people have no access to health care. Hospitals are either too far away or cost too much money. If a complication comes up during childbirth, the baby or mother is likely to die. One of the people trying to make a difference here in Karamoja is Pastor Philip Manan. He is also a local businessman with a kind heart and a ready smile. He was once an orphan living on the streets of Mbale in eastern Uganda, rescued by Pastor Kefa Sampanji in 1987. He wears many hats here in Karamoja. He loves his people and is always there to help when he can. Let's listen as he gives us a brief look into the Karamojan culture. I'm Reverend Philip Manang, the district overseer, PhD in a Park District. I'm going to talk about the Karamojong culture. Uh, as one of the Karamojongs, the Karamojongs, the name Karamojong is, is a tribe and then the Karamoja is a region. So here in Karamoja, we have customs, beliefs, and as Karamojongs, the Karamojongs have, right from the beginning, they believe in sacrifices. When any this misfortune comes in, like sickness, they always kill an animal, they smear themselves with the, that is inside the part of the body and then they will think that maybe by doing that they will be able to, to relieve themselves from any attack. So the Karamojongs are people who believe in polygamy. They marry many wives and they produce many children which they cannot even afford to take care of. The Karamojongs are people who like drinking. Drinking is like the order of the day. For them, they cannot even cook. In a day, you, you will never hardly will you find the Karamojongs cooking, but you find them seated drinking, taking local brew. That is the life, and then the local residue that they get from uh, the local brew, they take it for their children to eat. Uh, the Karamojongs would depend on uh, Many things like uh, they are cattle keepers, they take care of the animals, and that is what they believe that without a cow, for them there is no life, and without a sorghum, that is the staple food they eat. That's why they so much get involved in uh, even these issues of raids, they come as a result because they cannot be able to pay for all these women. The only thing is that to get other animals elsewhere for you to pay for a wife. When you want to get a wife in Karamoja, there is always what we call engagement. You start engaging the woman and the man. They have some times when they come together, they start jumping, jumping up. The higher you go, the lady will identify this is the right man for me. Nay, the same with the man. You will know that this woman really is, will be the woman that will help me. So that is how they identify. And when they get this girl, this girl is taken to the family of the parents for some good time to learn many things, uh, learn how to grind, learn how to cook, learn how to get firewood, and then from there, they will be able to continue working in their home. And finally, they get married. After getting married, then this lady is taken officially now home to be part of that family. So that is how the Karamojongs marry. But I know their culture is so difficult that it is not easy for the Karamojong to come out of the culture neither to tell the Karamojong leave drinking because that's the part of their lives. 
Uh, some years back, the Karamojong Sea is even to depend on uh, blood. They prick the animal, they get blood, and then they, they mix them with the milk. That's how they survive in the corrals. That is their food, daily food in the corrals. The biggest city in Karamoja is Moroto, which is part of the Moroto district. It is approximately 420 kilometers northeast of Kampala. This area has become very popular in recent years because of the large deposits of various minerals discovered here, like gold, marble, silver, copper, iron, titanium, and many more. New roads have been built to help transport the precious materials out of the region to Kenya and Kampala. Pastor Philip opened up this small shop named Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide in Matane, about 40 miles west of Moroto. He sells a variety of items, including small plastic bags with water in them because the normal plastic bottles are too expensive. Juice boxes, small cans of spaghetti, soft drinks, cookware, and salt. The Ugandan government has encouraged Karamojans to shift their livelihoods from pastoralists to farmers. Pastor Philip has made the transition by growing his own produce, but it is a hard sell to the people in the villages. Since Pastor Philip lives in the city, he can easily sell his produce at the local market, which is not the case for those living in the villages who have to walk many miles to sell their crops. 80% of Ugandans are dependent on rain-fed agriculture which makes up 60% of Uganda's export earnings. Thomas Charities, a nonprofit organization based in the United States, is working with Pastor Philip and others to develop arable land in northern Uganda and Kenya. They help villagers buy large plots of land, which are cultivated into community gardens that benefit the people in the villages. They have over 400 women participating in this program right now in a small village near Gulu, which is in north central Uganda. Of course, northern Uganda is in sub Saharan Africa, so they also need deep water wells and irrigation systems. Thomas Charities built five new deep water wells and fixed many others that needed repairs. This program works and is desperately needed in Karamoja. Their touch a village concept identifies needs in the villages and responds by helping them solve some of their problems. Clean water and access to health care are very important, and so is teaching people to become self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is the key to survival. Africans have to create their own jobs. The governments, or for that matter, corporations, do not create jobs that are available to villagers with no formal education. Pastor Philip and his wife Agnes are using their pulpit to not only feed souls, but also as a platform to help the community become self-sufficient. Training has been provided to help them develop income-generating projects like farming, sewing, and shopkeepers. The sky is the limit, and they are eager to grow their businesses. Most have never gone to any kind of school, so literacy training is vital. As the women have become more self-sufficient, many of the men are starting to realize that they can become useful again. Every potato or cabbage sold means that they will be able to buy clothes or sandals for their children. Their traditional way of life is evaporating rapidly. The Karamojong people, like many others in Africa, want to be able to send their children to school, learn how to read and write, see their children grow into adulthood, and start their own businesses. It is amazing to see the transformation that takes place in a village when someone comes to help. Lives are changed, families are made stronger, and hope returns. A new deep water well means children won't have to walk six miles for clean water and farmers will now have water for their gardens. 
School fees for children will enable them to complete high school and perhaps go to college. Literacy training for adults will help them become entrepreneurs and become more self-sufficient. Nonprofits like Thomas Charities are making a difference one village at a time. If you would like to make an investment that will radically change someone's life, please consider donating to Thomas Charities at www.thomascharities.org.